there are kind of three areas of ABM, three key areas of ABM that we're going to go over today. I'll kind of briefly touch them now and we'll, we'll go over them in more detail as we go on. So the first element is it's very strategic and targeted around a set of very specific accounts. So the best way to recognize ABM is, is very, very strategic and very focused. So as we said before, it's really about targeting quite a small group of accounts, certainly versus kind of like traditional inbound marketing, which would be catering to a much wider audience. So it's much more kind of tailored towards a smaller um, set of audiences. Um, and that's kind of determined on what the ROI that you've determined would be from those accounts. Um, so you'd be targeting accounts that you would be perceived to give you a high return of investment or might offer you kind of high strategic value to your book of business. So it could be a very significant company that might not be paying you a lot of dollars initially, but you know that you could grow them into quite a large account down the line. Um, and it might be a case of having that logo on board and associated with your brand is going to then help bring others on board as well. The second element to ABM is it's very much a multi-channel process. So this kind of omni-channel approach is super important for ABM. So it's going to be using things like email, social, um, using virtual uh, and in-person events, um, because it's really kind of geared towards different audiences and you need to make sure the messaging is coming across the right way. And that's definitely going to be, you know, need you to use a variety of different channels. And then the third element is really this kind of feedback loop as well, which is definitely an area that gets overlooked quite a lot in not just ABM, but in marketing in general, but it's really important to assess how much you're spending on the campaigns, obviously what the return investment was on the campaigns, how long the campaigns ran for to really get an idea of where the success was. And then obviously what you can do in the future to, uh, improve those campaigns moving forward as well. Got it. So you mentioned that one of the big things here is that the sales team and the marketing team are really working together on this. So what kind of value do you see uh, when sales reps are doing their part in this ABM approach? Yeah, absolutely. And just, just one thing actually to go back to my previous answer as well, because you asked us why we were talking about it. And I think it's important just to highlight why we're bringing this up and why it's such an important subject. I think Firstly, it can be a game changer for companies. If it's done well, it really can, you know, help revenues and, and logos skyrocket. But I think the other thing as well is that we find that in a lot of cases it's not being done in the most effective way. Um, and so what we're going to try and do in this podcast is sort of walk through some of the do's and don'ts in terms of your ABM strategy and, um, and hopefully kind of give you some best practices moving forward. Um, so in terms of the benefits for, for sales reps, because of the nature of ABM, because it's very targeted, because your pre-engaging client before you're reaching out to them. It means that the sales teams are going to be talking with companies that should have a much better product alignment um, with your solution. And so one of the byproducts of that is that um, there's less of a need for cold calling. So cold calling is obviously always going to have a place within sales, but I think we can appreciate that it's not always the most time effective way of closing deals. And so because sales reps are already talking with an audience that um, you know, be predetermined to have a good product fit, will probably be having, have been engaged at some point in, in the sales cycle, then it just means that there's less of a need for, for cold calling. I think one of the other beauties of ABM as well is the fact that you're going after specifically the decision makers or the people with high influence within that company. So what that is going to do, hopefully, is start to shorten sales cycles. So you're kind of almost negating straight to the top and, and um, I suppose, leaving behind some of the other um, stakeholders that you might have to go through, which again, if you look at more traditional inbound marketing, because it's a little bit broader and a little bit more general, you're generally going to be attracting people that are lower down on the decision making ladder. So again, having the benefit of speaking directly with um, you know, decision makers is going to hopefully shorten those sales cycles. And then you kind of touched on it there as well. I think one of my favorite elements of ABM is it really does require a close alignment between sales and marketing. So ABM cannot be successful unless you have sales and marketing working closely together, um, whether that's identifying prospects in the first case, whether that's um, talking about the kind of messaging for the content, whether that's deciding when to actually reach out to the prospects as well. It really does require sales and marketing to be working hand in hand. So if nothing else, if you're looking for a way in your organization to kind of break down the silos between sales and marketing, then ABM is a great thing to do. And, and obviously that will have multiple benefits moving forward as well.